This is Bulbasaur, and he is called a tiger salamander. There used to be tiger salamanders in Ontario. Uh, the tiger salamanders haven't been seen in the wild here, though, since the 1950s and are now considered extinct from the province. This is important to me personally to act as an advocate or an activist for salamanders um, just because it's something I grew up with and I feel that as a human being I'm in a position to try to make change and so I feel a sense of responsibility to use you know the time I have on this planet um, to the best of my ability and I want to do something that I think is fulfilling and, and that matters to me so I try very hard to contribute to a cause that I believe in. Um, and then it also matters to me as well because the problems that salamanders are facing have been created by people. So I think it's really fitting if people would be the solution. So I'm going to try to do my part and hopefully inspire others to do theirs as well. So salamanders are amphibians. They're related to frogs and toads. And although they look like lizards, uh, you can easily tell a lizard from a salamander because salamanders have no scales. They have soft, moist looking skin, just like a frog, while lizards are scaly like snakes and are dry. And they also have claws on their feet while salamanders don't. So although the body shapes look similar, you can easily tell them apart just by looking at them. Of the six different kinds of salamander found in Kingston, uh, there's actually a great bit of diversity there. We have a couple species of mole salamander, and uh, that family gets its common name because, as the name implies, they spend a lot of their time underground. Uh, we have a species of newt, and for people that are familiar with the word newt but might not be quite sure what that is, that's a, a kind of salamander that usually spends most of their time in the water. Uh, we also have a couple species of lungless salamanders. Um, so they actually do all their breathing through their skin. Their skin is very thin and sensitive. And then we have another type of aquatic species, which is different from a newt, because these ones have big external gills. Uh, so they don't have to come up for air. They can spend all their time in the water, and they're called mud puppies. So we have quite a number of different species and also a lot of diversity among those species. So these are the red-backed salamanders. They're the most common salamander in the Kingston region and often the most common species over their range. Uh, these ones are part of the lungless salamander family. So these ones do all of their air exchange through their sensitive skin. When I was a small child, I grew up in Oshawa, which is close to the greater Toronto area. So it was very urbanized. There wasn't a lot of nature for me to explore. Um, but I would spend my summers with my grandparents who had cottages in the Lando Lakes area. And I remember being about nine years old and searching the forest adjacent to our cottage. And I found what's called a red eft, which is spelled E-F-T. And it's a bright orange um, little salamander. And I remember finding it under this pile of shingles. And because the shingles were very black, um, the orange little eft or salamander stood out very vibrantly against that backdrop. So immediately I was enthralled with it because I had always had an inherent interest in uh, reptiles and amphibians. There's about 580 species of salamander in the world and half of those are at risk of extinction. So that's pretty significant. Um, and so when you grow up with something and you have a passion for something and then you realize that they're in trouble, obviously that was concerning to me and that inspired me to want to try to help salamanders. So now I run a project called Save the Salamanders and my main objective is to educate the public. So I do a lot of presentations and demos and I've talked to everything from, you know, grade one and kindergarten classes up to naturalist groups, which are you know, primarily older individuals, and then everything in between, college students, universities, high schools, special interest groups. So I try to take my message to a wide range, uh, array of people so, you know, everyone can appreciate these animals. This is the fire salamander, and they're found over most of continental Europe. The fire salamander gets their name from an old legend. So in ancient uh, in ancient times, uh, people would often send their servants out into the woodlands to collect firewood to make fires, and there would often be these salamanders hiding inside the old rotten logs, and when they would start the fires up, the salamanders would eagerly escape, obviously, because they didn't want to get burned. And the individuals that witnessed this didn't think the salamanders were coming out of the wood, but the fire itself. And there, so there's legends of salamanders being made of fire, salamanders that can breathe fire. Some people thought they were baby dragons. Uh, there's legends in parts of ancient Asia where salamanders can 
knit a special sweater and if you wore the salamander sweater you were impervious to fire so there's lots of myths and legends about salamanders with fire and that's where uh, this guy gets his name i was recently listening to an interview from jane goodall and she said that some people she believes are just inherently born with a love of animals and i think that's just part of who i am i just from as long as i can remember i've always had an interest in animals but particularly reptiles and amphibians and so salamanders caught my eye from a very early age and um, even now so many years later those memories of my first salamanders that i've encountered are, are very vivid and stick with me so i think that alone is sort of a testament to my uh, my passion for salamanders Thank you.